And I'm not suggesting we go back to a rehabilitation model. I'm suggesting that we actually let convicts take some of the lead role. When I went to the Congress that uh, Luke established in uh, Amsterdam in 1985, I was really struck by the absence of anybody from the bottom. And it struck me as like having a women's liberation movement without women. So how could you possibly have a penal abolition movement without prisoners? When Justice Action agreed to host ICOPRA 11 in Australia, we thought Tasmania would be the ideal setting for a penal abolition conference because of its history as the notorious penal colony of Van Diemen's land. As well, we would be able to combine such sessions with an ANZOC conference being held in Hobart and bring attention to present day conditions at Hobart's Risden Prison. We thought this would be an excellent base for ICOPA to develop its strategies for the future. Before I start, I do want to acknowledge the true custodians of the land, the Palawa people here in Tasmania. Many of you will know that the so-called human rights of prisoners and of course women prisoners have usually been compromised well before they've hit the criminal injustice system. That human rights are things most of these men and women have forgotten about. The experience of prison is just another experience on the continuum of struggle and despair that typifies many of their lives. I probably don't have to repeat the horrific statistics to you, but I will. Prior to going into prison, 98% of women have experienced physical abuse and 89% have experienced sexual abuse before they hit the gates. A great majority of them have grown up in poverty and abuse and where they have not been valued. The effects of poverty and abuse mean most have a low level education and very few skills. The attempts that make many of them turn to self-medication to deal with the pain of life mean a great proportion have addictions to drugs and or alcohol. Prisons have become the de facto psychiatric institutions in our communities where behaviours are not treated but punished, where people are not just chemically restrained but physically restrained and abused. Don't get me wrong here, I'm not advocating for psychiatric prisons for people who need medical support. And let's not forget the high proportion of course are Indigenous people and for them all of these things are multiplied, multiplied, exasperated and getting worse all the time. What I'd like to do is to sidestep the question of rights a bit and sketch out an argument that a complementary way to promote prisoners' concerns is through the notion of a discursive citizenship. Now there's various theories of citizenship with different stresses on the four key issues, rights, duties, participation and identity. But for all their many differences, all tend to fail to provide an explicit account of how membership of a specific community, which is the basis of citizenship, is acquired, and more importantly in relation to prisoners, how it's lost. And in relation to prisoners, a forfeit argument with historical roots in the feudal notion of civil death has been resuscitated and a good example of that is with the voting issue. And this forfeit argument is an amalgam of uh, retributivist desert, conceptions of impurity, taint and pollution, the visceral attractions of revenge, and the continued pertinence of Bentham's notion of lesser eligibility, whereby prison conditions um, should be kept below those of the honest poor outside. The continuing and in some instances growing power of that forfeit argument illustrates that in practice, and I think Debbie's drawn that out very, very clearly, uh, prisoners are neither full citizens, we have the voting restrictions, we have restrictions on the ability, post-release restrictions to, to serve on juries, um, it, in some jurisdictions the inability to seek criminal um, injuries compensation for injuries sustained in jail and so on. So they're neither full citizens nor non-citizens like arguably asylum seekers, but they are in fact partial or conditional citizens. Prisoner advocates and those who see citizenship in absolute terms and those who cite the, the liberal doctrine that people are sent to prison as punishment, not for punishment, of course all argue that um, the only qualifi qualification against absolute um, citizenship should be those necessarily qualified as a consequence of the irreducible conditions of imprisonment such as freedom of movement. Yet clearly in reality the pains of imprisonment involve far more, as Debbie's shown very clearly, more than mere restrictions on the freedom of movement as the whole history of the origins and development of the prison, the sociology of the prison and penology show us. Internationally, Canada's recognised as having the best prison system, especially for women prisoners, even more especially for Aboriginal women prisoners. The Canadian Human Rights Commission was not fooled, 
thankfully, and recognized and documented that, in fact, there was significant discrimination on the basis of race, sex, and, of course, gender. From there, our Public Accounts Committee, uh, our Auditor General, a number of other um, national groups issued scathing reports. We've now gone to the United Nations using some of those reports. Canada has been cited for discriminatory treatment of women prisoners at the UN level, and in fact has been told they have to report within a year. Some of you know the cycle is usually five years to report on um, international covenants and breaches of international covenants. Canada has to report again next year as a result of that inter intervention. So we see some positive movement. But more positive is I want to talk about the process that we employed and that really Louise Arbour helped launch us on the track of and what's happening now in what we call our Human Rights in Action project. Um, and when I say our, it's a project that is really has gen been generated by women inside and continues and will continue because of the involvement of women inside. Um, during, when Louise Arbour did the Commission of Inquiry, one of the things she did was she awarded standing to the women who were in prison. So for the first time ever, and I think internationally this is true, for the first time ever, women in prison had equal standing to correctional authorities and to the prison union, the guards union, at the table. So they had to be brought in, shackles taken off, participate fully. And we saw that action alone produce not just hope, but incredible energy and movement and politicization of the women who participated in that process. Welcome to the 11th ICOPA here at the University of Tasmania. We're very happy to be hosting it and uh, people attending from such far and wide places all over the world and all over Australia, so thank you. I'd first like to acknowledge the um, Aboriginal people the Palawa people whose land we're holding the conference on today. Now I'd like to introduce our first plenary session. Uh, we have with us today Terry Hicks and Phil, Professor Phil Scratton. Terry Hicks is a father of David Hicks, who is in prison at Guantanamo Bay. He's been there since 2001. He's the only Westerner left at Guantanamo Bay and the only Australian there. And our government has just been appalling in, um, in any work in terms of getting him back home. What I'd like to do at this point is just try and run through as much as I know on Guantanamo Bay's so-called prison system. David was sent to this prison system in 2001 and where he still is today. From what I can find from David and David's lawyers speaking to them, it's, um, it's, it's not a pleasant place to be spending any time. Anyone that knows anything about prison systems could probably back up what I'm talking about except for the torture tactics that are used. The gentleman that was looking after the prison system when David was there was a bloke by the name of um, um, General Miller. He was put into that situation because the gentleman that was before him wasn't crossing what they called a blurred line. He'd only work up to a point. Miller was then taken on board at Guantanamo Bay by the Cheneys, Bush and his cohorts, that they needed to rub out this line, that needed to be crossed. They will interrogate these prisoners however they like. When Miller come in, it was the brutalisation. It was the beltings. They had what they called an earthing group. It was a group of soldiers that come in with the riot gear if you didn't like what you was eating and you complained, five to seven of these gentlemen would come in <coughs> in full riot gear and give you the treatment. When I spoke to David a couple of years ago when we went across to the commissions, he was lucky he hadn't been earthed, as they called it. He said he'd been close a couple of times. He, had, he did say he'd been sexually brutalised, physically brutalised with the fists, the boots, the rifle butts, until such time as when Major Miller, or General Miller, whichever he called himself at that point in time, was shifted to a place called Abergrade, where he was implementing the same things that he was doing at Guantanamo Bay.
My work in prison started in the late 1970s and focused specifically on deaths in custody, uh, pre predominantly in the UK. One of the uh, proudest things that I can tell you about myself is that I'm a founder member of Inquest, the United Families for Justice, which is the one organization in the UK that fights for justice in terms of custody deaths. I'm not going to say very much about, um, uh, uh, about Guantanamo uh, because of what we've just heard from Terry. But one thing I do want to say is that at the height of the atrocities in uh, Afghanistan, and just as the atrocities were being translated into unlawful detention and the breach of um, the breach of the Geneva Conventions, our foreign minister was Peter Hain, the ex-anti-apartheid activist, um, the ex-civil libertarian, and I put an emphasis on ex. He's also now the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. Um, and when it, an inquiry was called for, particularly after the deaths of 900 prisoners who were held uh, just north of Kunduz in... Um, in, in sealed containers, like the containers that we see at the shipyards, um, which was one of the great atrocities of the war, he said, we do not see a need for an inquiry. Nasty things happen in war. And I think that one of the things that is, continues to be with me in terms of the, the, the whole handling uh, of both wars, both illegal wars, has been the way in which the solitary confinement, the beatings, the mock executions, the rape with instruments have been justified as if the people themselves deserve it, that they bring it on themselves. Rendition, which I'll just mention, the actual giving of prisoners to other countries to do the dirty work. I just want to allow Benyam Mohammed, who can't be here himself, to speak for himself. They cut off my clothes with some kind of doctor's scalpel. I was naked. They took the scalpel to my right chest. It was only a small cut, maybe an inch. At first I just screamed. I was shocked. Then they cut, off, they cut my left chest. One of them took my penis in his hand and began to make cuts. I was in agony. They must have done this 20 or 30 times in two hours. There was blood all over me. One of them said it would have been better just to have cut it off as I would only breed terrorists. Uh, one of the most refreshing things about this conference we heard in the last session, which is the free discussion that comes afterwards. And so as Brett has suggested, for those of you who can stay, I'd like then to take about half an hour for the kind of open discussion we had at the last session, okay? I want to start today, there's a kind of a logic to it, with uh, one of the main organizers of this ICOPA, Brett Collins from uh, Justice Action. As an ex-prisoner and 10 years inside jail, I acknowledge the fact that I'm just one person and there are 25,000 prisoners at the moment here in Australia. And of course, two million in the US and millions around, around uh, the world. And so we have a very uh, special obligation, an obligation and a responsibility because there isn't, as far as I'm aware of, another organisation anywhere in the world uh, addressing this issue of abolition of penal structures. We are currently encountering uh, a major expansion of imprisonment. I mean, we have uh, at the moment uh, doubled our imprisonment rate in the last 10 years. So the strategy we will adopt, first of all, the cost of imprisonment, the cost of $70,000 a person, and how in fact that's, most of that is spent in destructive uh, uh, money. We would, we would also make the point that um, the, 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 uh, the failure of, uh, of imprisonment, we talk in terms of the, the uh, crime, as a, uh, crime as coming out of prisons, that prisons are negative, they, that the recidivist rate of jails is enormous and getting worse. In, in New South Wales, the recidivist, recidivist rate, which is defined as uh, returning to jail within two years, is 45% and increasing. And, and in New South Wales, they didn't even measure that figure until we actually made the point that they couldn't call themselves corrective services with, without... Uh, um, uh, getting statistics on what they corrected and whom they corrected. And at that stage, they felt so embarrassed, they actually got the figures together. I've been working around abolition for about 10 years now. And I often hear people tell me or say that it's not very realistic. I used to be very bothered by these sorts of comments because I thought it just dismissed my way of thinking about the world. It dismissed my truth. 
And then I started to realize it had really uh, little to do with my um, <laughs> cognitive dissonance or faulty thinking, as corrections might tell you. You know, my faulty thinking to dream, to hope, to believe in something. But it had more to do with the person that was actually saying it. For not making the compromise, not making the effort, not making the time, not making the sacrifices. So today, when someone asks me or says, <laughs> abolition, where do you even begin? I tell them it's real simple, it's simple. You've got to be the changes you want to see in the world. And that's my truth, as I best understand it today. Sebastian Scheer in uh, uh, 1985 at uh, the ICOPA in Amsterdam uh, talked about penal abolition as a social movement, that we have a vision, uh, 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 a strategy, and a desire to make an essential reordering of the societies that we live in. Of course, the uh, a primary focus is to roll back uh, uh, the kinds of punitive deterrent models that are in place across the West. Indeed, the very first uh, uh, two conferences were prison abolition conferences. And it was when we came to understand uh, that you can't take the prison uh, 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 simply out of a system uh, without taking the system down itself that we reformulated it to be penal abolition, which takes in the broader context. Now, as far as I understand it, prison abolition rose out of the ashes of the rehabilitation movement. And the subsequent wave of failures of things like, I, uh, you know, my own involvement in the 1960s and 70s was a real halt, halt, full bore attack on uh, penal re rehabilitation as a misplaced uh, entity generally. Uh, with its clinical suggestions and frameworks. And I say suggestions because it was never really clear uh, exactly what kinds of programs were put into place. It was I want to pick up from where Bob left off because Bob emphasizes the bringing in of voices and the turning to prisons and prisoners to understand the criminal justice system. And when I say criminal justice system, I am talking about a criminal type of justice system. So it's a criminal justice system, just so you know as I go through. Um, and I, I want to add to that because I believe that when, when we're talking about prisoners that we're actually talking about people of color. And more specifically, we're in, in the context of America and Africa, we're talking about people of African descent or Africans. Um, my time in Nigeria showed me that the criminal justice system uh, exists on African soil and that it was brought there by European colonialists. And that the same system which legalized um, slavery and colonialism now so-called governs the actions of people in so-called civil society in Nigeria, Ghana, the Gambia, my experiences. And I could talk about that and I will tomorrow, but today I actually want to focus more specifically on America because I'm living in the United States and it does feel like the belly of the beast. And I have learned a lot while I've been there. Um, and the thing that I've learned most about is that in order to understand prisons, and to understand abolitionism, we must see the larger picture of population control. And the work coming out of the people of color communities and the people of color scholars in America and the United States have really inspired me to step and look back and see the functionality of prisons, as Foucault would say. I agree very much with Vivian that when we look at our movement, that in that movement, we have to bring elements of very different civilizations. And for me, anyway, uh, one of the civilizations which is so important for me, my own growing into abolitionism uh, was indeed uh, to learn about the civilization of what we call the older people. And how those civilizations of those older people, quite contrary to what many people had been thinking and which I have been raised also in, that there was progress and that we were better and that we had a, a, a deeper civilization. Uh, I learned uh, that many of them had, according to my standards of civilization, a deeper, uh, a, a deeper civilization. We had uh, various polls in through our media here and it ended up um, reported between 47 and 50% of Australians agreed with that death penalty. 
So how do we engage the public then as well? Because without going into <coughs> those three, a political economy, the public, then the goals will not be realised. I think one of the things that's happened in social welfare states is we've been spending our time defending uh, past gains and we have not moved forward. And I think that's been problematic. <coughs> we've been gatekeepers in many ways of, of the rollback. Uh, I, I, I would argue that criminology creates crime, and it seems to me that a lot of the discourse that we've engaged in should be a discourse in the, the realm of social welfare. So to get back to the, uh, the, 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 the more uh, key aspects of your question, if you go back, and I, for me it's a conundrum, if you go back to the beginning of, of penal abolition, but it was also a moment of great uh, uh, growth and interest in terms of rolling back punitive justice at all. Thomas Matheson in 1974 actually believes that the prison, at least in Scandinavia, is going to go missing. And when you compare that to today, it, it, it's kind of breathtaking. Uh, it seems to me that, and I, I'm partly, certainly in my jurisdiction, part of the problem, is in trashing rehabilitation, we stop putting forth the image of the convict that is a positive one. You know, we threw it all out, the baby with the bath. And we moved in these directions to our community alternatives and soft ends, and we actually stopped humanizing prisoners. And I, that was my point, that it seems to me that we need to get back right, to that initial movement. And I'm not saying get rid of the rest, but I'm saying that a strength of our focus to move forward has to be to go back to that discourse. And it did work in the era of, of rehabilitation. I got a phone call just over a week ago asking whether I would do a talk here about sexual assaults in prison. My initial reaction was just to say no. Um, I've been there, I don't want to know any more about it, it's over, <coughs> I want to move on. But then the conscience kicked me and I owe it to those who have been assaulted, especially those who have been sexually assaulted, so this is for them. To receive a phone call to say that a family member has been arrested would be a trauma in itself. Uh, to find out that this person has been remanded in custody would also be terrifying. Then to find out this person is now in protection where the pedophiles are is just biggest belief. Come up with a corrupt police brief, went to the coroner's court, who willingly or unwillingly accepted that corrupt brief, also narrowed the proceedings so justice was not allowed to be done. Witnesses were barred, evidence was barred. I and others attempted to get some sort of sanity into that court. We were more or less barred from the court. We were thrown out. We were not allowed to interrupt the court. And of course the police were exonerated and walked out smugly smiling, as is their want whenever they get away with this. Now another particular recommendation was that arrest would be as a matter of last resort. The police don't even know that's there. The other one for the courts is incarceration, will be as a matter of last resort. I just want to talk a little bit about um, the intersection um, and the symbiosis between ending deaths in custody and um, strategies of penal abolition and profound decarceration. Um, because um, I see them as absolutely intermeshed projects, absolutely intermeshed work. The only way that we can possibly um, intervene and attempt to end the, the state's proclaimed right to terminate life, to engage in individual and mass acts of extermination, is to absolutely attack the fundamental violence that the state relies upon, multiple forms of violence that relies upon to inscribe that power uh, on the bodies of millions and millions of people um, and most ultimately on their deaths and on their, on their families. The site of the death changes all the time. You know, there's, uh, first of all, it's in the prison cell and then it's in the then it's in the pursuit, and then it's the person has been released. And so there's this, this, this whole um, displacement, if you like, you know. As soon as 
um, people start focusing, like in the Dense and Positive um, uh, inquiry, into one particular form of death and custody, then the site of this changes. Mm. And so they say, oh, we don't have that problem anymore, but it's actually just been shifting. Well, nothing ever been solved. No, and the other thing I just wanted to say about that, the deaths in custody thing was that I was um, here in Hobart in 1986 when the ALP conference debated uh, setting up the deaths in custody, and it was, I have to say, conceived in sin. In that, um, basically, it was, uh, they abolished the ALP's uh, policy of national land rights and, and the payoff that they would set up this inquiry. Of course, one of the recommendations of the inquiry is that if Aboriginal people have land rights, then they're less likely to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to, to you know, yeah. form such large percentage of the prison population. So it was always a, a compromise. So many people who died in custody were from stolen generations. Yes. We forgot that. And also, yes. Yes. I found a significant number of people who died already had intervention, as you said, generally from the time they were children. Mm -hmm. They were marginalized in the so called care intervention system. And that's what I found out. Now, if that's overwhelmingly abhorrent that they're targeted as children who grew up in the adults who died and they stole their parents. You know, the parenting, the blame, it's unbelievable. And that's something we've got to move away from. We were able to challenge, through the library, the whole system of what a prison is supposed to be. And I can only just share with you, if, if we didn't have the library, to have to verbally battle with them the same as what you're talking about, the library, as far as our city is concerned, is going to make a tremendous difference. And in the back of our little prospectus, which it's a bicultural prospectus, it just says, building communities, not prisons. Strong, vibrant and caring communities are the foundation upon which our society is built. Responsibility for ensuring the well-being of a community belongs to each and every one of us. Let us help to take up the challenge, making our community safer and more prosperous for the next generation. People hold the key, not the state. And we're able to say at the end that the Napier's Pilot City Trust in particular want to acknowledge the lifelong work of Ruth Rittenhouse Morris. I had not any possibility to tell what I was thinking <laughs> about alternatives. And therefore, I do that now. <laughs> I do that now because what nobody said, as, as far as I could hear, but I could not hear everything because I am a little bit deaf. <laughs> but according to me, practically none of those criminalizable events is ever criminalized because they happen between people who know each other. And they are quite normal aspects of the interaction between people. And when your child steals from you, or you steal from your child, or your friends, or the people in the sports club, naturally you are not going to the police. And so those things are never coming to the police, and they are dealt with by the people either in straight lines or in meandering huh, between them. That is how nearly always all the criminalizable events are dealt with. When I was Children's Commissioner in Tasmania from 2000 for three and a half years, I came to realize that they were actually putting children and young people into adult prisons and adult remand centers. And I objected to that strongly and recommended to the government they shouldn't do that and I became a member of Prison Reform Alliance of, of Tasmania. I said, I'll stay in here till they make a commitment not to put kids in adult prisons. And the second thing was to try and get kids away from juvenile justice facilities and intervene early to do a human rights approach for helping children and families early so they don't go into the juvenile or prison system. In other words, address the issues facing each child, each family, 
that lead them to the pathways that lead them to prison and juvenile justice. When you have children and young people deprived of their liberty, you are depriving them of the most fundamental human right that you have in a democracy. You're depriving them of their freedom, their liberty, their right to associate with their peers and their families. And it's got to be the last resort. And it isn't. It's often a resort because you haven't got any other options in the community. So you're betraying anything you believe in, in democracy, and you're betraying even the laws of Tasmania. Mark Forget's presentation, which looked at challenging the idea of authority and looking at the fact that our society is set up from very early on to teach us to subjugate ourselves to authority. And some of the work that he has been doing with children in schools has challenged that and has had some quite promising um, results in children actually learning to engage with one another and reflect on their own behaviour without having um, punishment applied to them or consequences imposed upon them. I had argued right, right from the word go that the prison system now is much worse than it was when we were in there. And we were talking about we burning their jails down and taking them off pretty quick. Um, and a lot of it stems from the secrecy um, and the fact that prisoners are always liars. In, in um, press reports from 1970 and 1974, we had a minister for justice called John Clarkson Madison. Never forget the proof. He, he um, repeatedly, if prisoners are liars, you can't believe that they've, they've been bashed or whatever. However, we had psychologists like Len Evans, who was sitting in, a, in an office in Long Bay, and every prisoner walked in, it's the same story, it's the same story. And in the end, he's gone, no, nah, this isn't any good. I believe this, the, 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 the menace is wrong. And when he raised the issue, their response was to Shanghai and to sit at an empty desk in head office. The media part of it, we didn't have newspapers in them days except maybe the Sunday paper. And you get a newspaper, any article about prisons was cut out. They'd cut it out, physically cut it out. There might be a few newspapers get in the jail and you couldn't read anything about prisons. So all the way up here? Dead set. Really? Jeez, that's going back. But we had the, we had the, the radio and, the, you know, and the, the fact was that people were out there and they were. They did support the issue that people were getting flogged, and it's an extremely violent place to be in. But we had a solidarity then. There was an economy in the prison system, money and tobacco. I bought me law books from playing cards, good card player. I wanted money and I bought me law books. And, um, and, then, and I walked into a, they gave me a job in the tinsmiths. I walked in, it was like a oh, homework. Every fuck up that I ever met, in the boys' home is there. But really what Brisbane's like now is a culmination of these two uh, things, uh, isn't it? Because uh, it's got uh, the gang mentality, the drugs, yeah. there's no yeah. solidarity. We talk about Golden Jar and Bathurst and all that, about how they used to be. That is how Brisbane is today. Just uh, briefly from our group, we actually had quite a um, vigorous discussion and debate and I think useful um, exchange of, of ideas on the whole relevance, resonance, usefulness um, at all of using a human rights framework. And there was, I think, good discussion about the, um, the, the dangers and the disadvantages sometimes of speaking in absolute terms about rights that for prisoners, if you, you know, people in this room know better than I do, but just having spoken to prisoners have been inside and visited um, prisoners that they don't they don't feel anything real or tangible or any benefit from this idea of human rights and they don't feel that their rights that they have any Maybe I'm tired of being like a bad girl, 
if you talk about abolition or rights of prisoners, or however the case may be, that somehow that denies victim status. So I think I thought it was important that we needed to talk about this notion of victim, which has been created through the criminal justice system, and kind of raise that issue. Um, so to having said that, the first thing I want to do, say, because I think this is important, in no way do I want to minimize or deny any of the hurt, harm, you know, that that certain acts cause or create amongst people, individuals, groups. I'm not minimizing or denying any pain or suffering or damages, but what I am doing is questioning how we promote this idea of victim and who's allowed victim status, you know? Most of what I took from the victim's uh, work was from a, a, a bloke, to use a term, <laughs> Robert Elzius, I like. What he does, he talks about how the victim's movement as a whole movement emerged in the 80s and 90s, which and it, uh, it was coincided with the war, particularly in the States, the war on crime and the war on drugs. And so what happened was the victims' movement was linked up to a crime control agenda. The naming of some of the crimes that are committed, and in particular the concern is that we have to take seriously the experiences of harm that is done and, how, um, and the impact of that. This was discussed in regards to the harm associated with the crimes of rape, sexual assault. Some of those um, heinous crimes that are in fact perpetrated um, more often against women. Secondly, um, there was, this, there was a discussion and it, and it was ringing a bell for a lot of us and that was that when we talk about once somebody has been identified as having been victimized, the justice system often swoops in and will take over even though those who, who have been uh, um, victimized, I use that in, in uh, brackets, don't want that. So what would happen is they would put people inside the cell and they would close the door. And air was available in the front of the cell because there was a hole right in the ceiling. So that was the one part of it was social control, <laughs> divide and conquer. But the other part of it was to also make sure that the fittest person survived out of the dungeons into slavery. That gate right there, this is for patients, and it's the gate of no return. And every fourth that I went to had a gate, which was the exit for people taken out of the dungeons, onto the boats and out. So one thing you can notice uh, is the high demand population in the Nigerian prison. Somebody that has been in prison for 10 years, uh, the person has no skill, the person, you, 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 if the person just come out of the prison like that without any skill, no reformation, you know, reintegration will be a problem. And moreover, the government doesn't have a plan for them and where they will stay when they leave the prison. So basically what happens is that they will go back to the same crime that took them to prison in the first place before you know it, they come back to. So we are telling the government, if you, have to let the, if, if you want to let these people go, let there be a plan for them so that when they come out, there will be something tangible for them to do. Even just a house or a shelter to stay. Then welfare for the inmate, as, just as I said before, is very horrible. We have a lot of um, crowded prisons. A lot, you see a lot of inmates in prison, just like even what we see in the case of Rwanda. We are, we are the inmates that are staying in a tent and uh, some of them catching tuberculosis uh, just because of that. The vulnerable prisoners, the issue of women in prison, women with children in prison. Children are not supposed to be in prison. So women are giving birth in prison in Nigeria with uh, little medical attention to those women. No education in prison, no skill acquisition, rehabilitation, dissenting, reintegration, even more problem because once the, <laughs> the inmates leave the prison, after two weeks, they are back in prison again because the society will reject them. There's no job for them. They can't do anything. There is poor record keeping in Nigeria. Most of the prisons, some of them don't even have computer to keep records. So, and, and that's why some of the inmates stay there for years. Without, at times, you see the case files missing. There is no good, uh, good data management system or record keeping in Nigeria. Then, then, then there is no monitoring. Of, um, of, of the prison, except maybe by the NGOs, some of us, but the government has no institution that monitor what is happening in the prison. So even it's just the NGOs that does the monitoring of detention centers and the, and the inmate situation. The HIV in prison is another issue in Nigeria because at times some of the inmates, uh, okay, the, the inmates are not allowed to bring in maybe sharp instruments or that, but if any of them manage to smuggle anyone in like um, one razor blade, about 10 of them might end up using just one, one razor blade to shave. 
and because of that, it's helping spreading HIV in Nigerian prisons. One of the statistics that I think hit home for me the most was that in Rwanda, at least one person in each Rwandese, Rwandese family is in prison. One person from each family. That's staggering to me. Um, and, uh, and, and I think really highlights the fact that we need to pay more attention to our African brothers and sisters because when we're getting the numbers on um, prison rates, uh, certainly these are not the numbers I'm getting in the official statistics, so we need to be really asking the people on the ground about what, what the hell's really happening. I'm sure in all jurisdictions, all the places we're from, that we can find and identify such institutions, but certainly, and I don't implicate anybody here, obviously, you know, not the person I'm talking to, but the Tasmanian and Australian governments should be ashamed. The physical plant is old and filthy. The room they took us into is patched on the wall. I mean, if that's the best they can offer visitors, what indeed does it look like, I thought, back in the bowels of the place? Um, we met with uh, 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 two Aboriginal prisoners. We had been told before that there were 14 in the institution. As it turns out, indeed, there are 80. Uh, um, they, they, the, the two prisoners were uh, accompanied by a social, what I would call a social development officer, uh, who was uh, also of uh, Aboriginal descent and who I, I thought was quite open with us and certainly the prisoners felt free to, to, to talk. In the new prison outside, a new women's uh, max unit, they've um, tailored the cells, built the cells. They said based on Queensland, but like Bob said, that, you know, that comes from the US. Um, four cells under camera that you can see absolutely everything from the showers to the toilet and everything. They were suggesting no, the cameras are just that way, but you know you can see the cell. And then there's domes on the roof in every cell that when you look in you can actually see their mirrored domes anyway. So women will be under constant surveillance no matter what they're doing in their cells. I was a boy, four year old, ended up in a boy's home. Stayed there till I was 15 years old. Ended up in prison. <clears throat> at 15 and a half I was in Risdon Prison and stayed at Risdon Prison and other institutions all over Australia for about 30 years. Life is a, a lot different than we know it out here about jail. They've turned the yards now into a little dog yards for people to, to, to walk in. They're handcuffed, they're belted, they've even got shackles on them. They've gone back to Port Arthur days. They've got another U division there now, they call it the High Security Division, uh, HR, D7 I think they call it. It's HR, the old kitchen yard. These boys are locked up 23 and a half hours a day. Um, they're allowed out for half an hour's exercise. They've got no weights, they've got, they're building cages 12 by 12. Prior to this sentence, I served about two and a half years in different lagging, six months, two and a half years and six months. In total, I've spent 22 years in prison. I've also been in detention centres in a boys' home. Out of my 42 years, I've spent approximately 26 years in institutions of some type. In 1989, I decided to either change or commit suicide. I chose the former. Uh, over the last couple of days, I have to say I've been very inspired by words of many people as in what I cope is about, what we stand for, and, 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 and I, th I think it's a wonderful thing, but the questions that stay in my mind uh, most of all is, okay, what are we going to do about it, and how are we going to do it? What prison done for me, instead of turning me into someone productive, if they turn me into a person that could pretty much kill you in an instant. Um, I haven't had this anger that I've feel now. I, 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 I never grew with this. They created it, um, and and I think the prison system as a as a whole really should look at. All right, you can't fix crime, but you can certainly fix a criminal. I want to talk about that and what it's done to me, and, and, and especially the siege, because the siege was an important part in Tasmania's prison history. We had a collective group of men that decided to occupy reception. What did they do it for? 
They didn't do it for wine, women or song. They didn't do it for, for lesser sentences. Um, or, you know, um, cry, there wasn't cries of innocence. This was all about, those were all about human rights issues. I don't want to be abused anymore. In New South Wales and many people that go to prison that haven't used drugs, um, like one, um, 20 per cent um, end up using drugs, um, become addicts. Yeah, we had one person that I used to visit, a poor boy, he was sort of set up by a gang um, and he was sent off to prison. We, we worked, we tried our best to get him out into some of the um, houses, you know, yeah, leaf yeah. houses, and no <coughs> mandatory prison for him. Within four months, he hung himself. And the reason why he hung, I mean, he might as well have been given a death sentence to begin with. Joanne Martell, Bree Carlton, and Sharon Deb Singh elaborated on how they saw the segregation policies and issues, but more on what segregation does to the, in, the individual, women especially. And without detracting anything from any of the presentations made, uh, and I know we went over time, but I was uh, under the control of the dictatorship of, of the audience, um, the most telling thing that come across to me was a remark made by Sharon Dev that the same firm that is making the shackles and chains that are used in segregation units around the world is in fact the same company that was <coughs> making the chains for the slave trade. But Deborah is an example of the triumph of people who are oppressed and of people who are put down, who uh, can survive all that and reclaim their identity, reclaim the integrity as to who they are. That goes for prisoners too. And she's an inspiration to all of us because she's now become the, a leader in our community. And I'm very, very proud to present to you Deborah Hocking, who is a Tasmanian Aboriginal, to welcome us to her country. Thank you. A lot has been lost. Uh, identity, um, your culture, heritage, a lot of things are taken from you. And I have spent quite a few decades in reclaiming those things that were taken from me. Part of that journey is also looking at our language um, that was used, that was forbidden for many, many decades to be used. We've been going through a reclaiming process recently with our language and it's been difficult and it hasn't been the ideal way to do it, but we have reclaimed a certain amount of our language. And I'd like to welcome you here today in my language. Ya tawacha, nomba croati palawa na mina nala. Mina debra, mina patabella tagari lia, muhanina, Fanny Cochran Smith. Palawa. Takamuna Nompa, Muhanina, Ya Tawacha. Hello and welcome here today to Aboriginal land. I am Deborah. My ancestors came from Muhanina people and Fanny Cochran Smith. The Aboriginal people that roamed this land were the Muhanina people, and I would like you to welcome you here today as one of the descendants of the Muhanina people. Thank you. We're here to talk about prison resistance and I'll have to declare right up front that um, in my case it might be a lot different to other prisoners' experiences of prison resistance because um, for me it was made a lot easier because I was a member of an illegal organisation called the Irish Republican Army and it was in a, a war situation in Belfast and uh, at 17 I joined the IRA after witnessing several murders on internment night and if you're not familiar with what internment is, it's being arrested without trial and it was a very dramatic night. There was 350 men put in an internment camp without trial, without any recourse to a court hearing, without any, any uh, access to solicitors. You were just put in, the British Army arrested you, trailed you out, put you away. But on that night, nine people in my area were shot dead. One of them was my uncle and one of them was a woman called Mrs Connolly. It was just like Donald's. 
People were running around it, not knowing what happened. And at the top of Spring Hill Avenue where I lived, my uncle was looking for his children. And he was 42 years of age, he was in his bare chest, no pair of bedroom slippers, and a pair of trousers. And it was May, and British Army were ripping houses up. And he was running around looking for his sons. And he was shot dead. He was shot, he didn't die right away. Mrs. Conley was shot dead. Martin Butler was shot dead. Joe Corr was shot dead. The priest, Father Hugh Mullen, ran out to try and assist the, the women who were dying, and he was shot dead. Mm. And we could not get over to them. We had to watch them lying there all night. So after I saw that, no one was charged with those murders. And it was the night of mayhem, so, and it was right across the six counties of Ireland that this internment was going on. And in, in the middle of all that, these people who were murdered, basically, were not mentioned in the papers. No one was ever charged for the murders. And um, <clears throat> when I saw that, that was a turning point for me. And I joined the Irish Republican Army and I engaged in war with the British forces and with the state forces, which were the RUC. Fuck, you this to you. you can just hope that um, in, 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 in future times that we can recognise that we are we are human yeah. as prisoners and, and that, that, that something uh, may be done in the future that so we, we can progress rather than regress yeah. and, um, and, and make something better of ourselves. The offer of hope, freedom with responsibility, responsibility to self and community. We, prisoners of Australia, call upon governments to acknowledge that having lost our freedom of movement, we are still entitled to all other rights and safeguards provided to those outside prison. We believe in the real meaning of the term corrective services. Instead of wasting government money, causing fear in the community and allowing our lives to slip away in despair, we believe that with help, trust and encouragement, we can return to our communities families and friends and make a positive contribution to society. I think ICOPA needs to take up um, in a more um, overt way issues of sexuality and queerness in the ways that we think about and talk about the work that we're doing. Um, and the example I was giving was of, um, in my organization, Justice Now, where we talk about people in women's prisons because the state decides where people go, which institutions they go to, and those aren't necessarily the ways that people identify themselves. And um, so that kind of gender self-determination is actually important. The main points that Ray raised were that uh, the link to the land is their culture, is the Aboriginal culture, and respect, responsibility and ritual all start with the land. If the children cannot be taken back onto the land to join in their culture, then that they'll continue to fill our jails. Uh, the other thing was that uh, Ray mentioned that Indigenous programs will only be successful and will only work if they're not funded, because once they're funded, then the government wants to take control away from the Indigenous people. I feel that ICOPA is the only decentralized movement that I've come across which uh, resists the notions of organization as a movement. And I think that the fact that it moves around the world and, and visits different countries and addresses local issues in those countries makes it a very powerful movement. Um, I also feel that it's one of the few um, abolitionist, truly abolitionist attempts that we have going on um, in contemporary society. The first ICOPA started in Toronto in 1983 and it was hosted by Canadians, social activists, academics, uh, workers within the criminal justice system. Um, the focus at that time was on the abolition of prisons. Prisons were seen as counterproductive institutions that served no real purpose. Uh, the, ar the argument there is that there are maybe two to three percent of prisoners who are a serious threat to society and have to be for security purposes kept on their lock and key, but that 80 percent prisoners could be on the street without any problems if they were given the help to resettle and to cope. Uh, we argue that another 15 to 18 percent of prisoners have been so messed up by their societies and their long-term incarceration and the like that they need help to readjust. But they are not themselves a danger either if provided that help. So from that understanding, uh, the, the primary focus at the beginning was prisons as a dysfunctional institution. 
a one that was counterproductive, that turned young, uh, uh, rebellious uh, men and women into criminals. The next conference, and ICOPA is a biannual conference, the next conference in 1985 was held in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And that conference was much more academic in scope, and it included many critical European uh, sociologists, criminologists, uh, some social activists. And it was from that conference that the very uh, concept of prison abolition was transformed or changed, widened in scope uh, to that of penal abolition. The argument being is that one can't take one institution of an array of interrelated institutions out of the mix without having to deal with all the processes that surround it. So our understanding was if we wanted to downsize the use and reliance on punitive justice, that we had to deal with the law. We had to deal with criminalization generally. The discriminations and inequalities that reek throughout that system, or that system reeks from. Uh, so the concept became penal abolition. Now, uh, ICOPA has toured the world since. I'm a Tasmanian prison activist um, who uh, was thinking with a group of other people to have a national activist conference in, in Hobart, and we thought we'd actually have it at the end of the ANZOC conference. And I was talking to Brett Collins about this, and he convinced me that we should uh, offer Tasmania as a spot for the ICOPA conference, cause, uh, because it hasn't been held in Australia. So we agreed to that and left the National Prison Activists Conference. Uh, my first ICOPA was in New Zealand in 1997. And then we went to Toronto, and then um, I, I helped organize the one in Nigeria, and then here in Australia. The Nigerian one was an incredible experience, um, aside from the fact that I got to live in Nigeria and learn about a different society and, and learn about myself more than anything else. I think that the, the main thing with the Nigerian ICOPA was the starting point wasn't to convince people that there was something wrong with the system. There's a general understanding amongst the Nigerian, uh, most West African people that I spoke to, that there is something wrong with the criminal justice system, that it's a colonial system, that it doesn't belong on African soil. So the starting point for ICOPA in Nigeria was how do we get rid of this system or how do we stop relying on this system and what do we do instead? ICOPA to me is very good because um, since we hosted the ICOPA in 2002, it has uh, brought um, uh, the, the attention of our government to some of the evils in our criminal justice system and the need um, to reverse um, some of the problems we have in the criminal justice systems. Like uh, the ICOPA in Nigeria basically look at um, alternative to, imp to, to incarceration or, or imprisonment because then we look at um, the other alternative like, like community service which was not uh, in the status book of uh, our criminal justice system. And uh, because, of, um, because of the fact that our, our government pays a little attention to alternative to, to, to imprisonment, we have a lot of problems like in the prisons, a lot of awaiting trials in the prisons, crowded cells, and, um, and uh, some of the inmates having, um, having their sentence being prolonged uh, over a long time. But if we have an alternative to imprisonment, some of these, um, these issues uh, will not come up. So it's brought together um people from all around the world who previously may uh, not see each other very often. In my case, I've not met a lot of these people. And if you work in prison activism, particularly in somewhere like Tasmania, we're very isolated here. So it's been fantastic for all of us to meet the people that we've heard about. There's never been a more important time than the present for this, uh, particularly wanting to make the relationship between the way that uh, places like Guantanamo Bay and Abu Ghraib have come into the public consciousness. Um, but that reflects within our own advanced democratic states a uh, way of imprisoning people that is completely unacceptable. And so ICOPA as an international movement is really vital in making us rethink about the way in which prisons are constructed, the way in which people are held in custody, and the whole concept of incarceration. But I would also want to take it a bit wider than that and see it as part of a criminal justice system that is essentially corrupt and doesn't develop uh, justice in any kind of way that is recognizable as just forms. Uh, because what we're seeing here is uh, very narrow definitions of crime rather than broader definitions of harm. And we're seeing criminal justice being imposed 
right the way through from policing to the prisons to, to, to forms of imprisonment that we know a form of criminal justice that doesn't take into account the social injustice that people suffer, a whole range of social injustices, marginalization, exclusion, uh, and obviously the issues around class and race and gender within our societies. In New South Wales, the men, the male, uh, incarceration rate is 18 to 20%. For women, it's 20 to 25%. And for our youth, both male and female, it hovers around the 40% mark. Now that is got to be put in the context that we are a little over 2.3% of the state population. And we are greatly overrepresented in the penal system. This I cope in a sense for us is a returning to roots returning to our initial agendas to rethink it in terms of new times. To have uh, uh, the Justice Action Group uh, uh, to host, ex-prisoners to host ICOPA, uh, is a, a real step forward in, that, in uh, uh, that regard. I think also that the location in Van Diemen's Land uh, is highly symbolic about what we want to talk about. The atrocities that occurred here in the past uh, are still, to most of our minds, apparent in today's prisons. I find that we're still caught in, in a lot of, um, of criticism of, of the prison system and how awful it is and, and, and how bad it is for people involved. Um, but we all know that here. Uh, we've, we're all here because we already believe that. And so my, my hope was to have a little bit more focus this time, and, and I guess my hope is for next time, on the question of abolition itself and, and what what would society look like without punishment? And once we have developed uh, some form of, of common vision on that, uh, how do we get there? How do we move from here to there? What are the first steps that we can take toward abolition and not? The danger is that if we don't have a clear agenda, if we don't have a clear roadmap, we fall into a lot of our efforts fall into reform. Our situation, as far as Tasmania is concerned, is, is that we have a government that's not the least bit interested in dialogue. Um, we've been, all the prison activists have been locked out of the jail. Uh, we are to have no, we've been told that we will be banned until further notice, that we, we, we have absolutely nothing to do with um, the justice system or the, or the prison system at all. Today we actually tried to go out to the prisoners as a group of ICOPA delegates and I was out, uh, went out with them. Uh, hoping, I guess, that I would, if the others were allowed in, that I would be allowed in, um, because I have been banned, um, but none of us were allowed in. We spend an awful lot of time, I guess, um, dealing with complaints from the prison system, both from families and, and prisoners. And uh, we recently, or last year, published quite a substantial report on those complaints. Uh, and although we disseminated it fairly widely around Australia and overseas, the uh, Attorney General has not taken an ounce of notice of that and in fact this week said that most of our complaints, the majority, the vast majority uh, of the complaints that we made uh, in that report were um, unsubstantiated and wrong. So we're dealing with a system that won't even have any dialogue with us at all I must say that it hasn't always been like that. We were actually uh, getting somewhere, I guess, in a way, up until the siege of May last year, and because we commentated on the siege and we supported what the prisoners were doing, um, and essentially they felt they had no other voice but to um, take this drastic action. So we were supporting them um, with our own commentation on that doing national and international media, and we were blamed for being instrumental in uh, being involved in the riot, in the siege, and we have been banned since then. Here in Tasmania, on a former penal colony, um, I also felt that the communications with the prison system here were extremely strained. Um, I saw that the prison system in Tasmania has a lot to hide because they were very guarded about providing any access to anybody um, and in interactions with people that have done time um, in Australia and interactions with activists who are trying to get access to prisoners here. Um, I was um, not surprised, but frustrated with the fact that this former penal colony continues to use the penal system 
um, continues to ignore its history and continues to perpetuate its exclusion, um, its um, closed door policies. I, I was frustrated that it's, it felt like nothing had changed. I, I, I just really must thank ACOPA and Justice Action because only through them and their determination and their work, I wouldn't have got a visa to come here in the first place. Um, the other thing I want to say, I'm, I'm well used to meetings where there are hundreds of different opinions on small things. But I have to say about all of you, you're all good people. You all have really good intentions and you do great work. And in the end, that's what I'll carry away from here. What I want to do is personally thank ICOPA and the people who organised it again for believing that I should be here and making that possible. I also would have liked to seen more Aboriginal faces here. I think that's something that needs to be looked at. Aboriginal voices are not very much heard, except when people like me get behind the microphone, then you can't shut us up. But I'd also like to say thank you to the people I've met and I am going to leave this ICOPA conference with a lot of good memories. It's been one of the best conferences that I've been to.